Welcome to episode 34 of Coin Concede, a podcast about Hearthstone. My name is Kenny, and all the way from Thunder Bluff, Louisiana, we have Jace, a.k.a. Cinder, with us. Cinder, how have you been? Pretty good, Kenny. Loving some of these new decks that have been evolving in the meta. It's been it's been very frustrating at times, but at times, hella, hella fun. <laughs> it seems a lot more fun, at least for me, to play now, so I'm, I'm excited. Oh, definitely. It's so much fun. Even just watching, I'm having fun. All right. And all the way from Undercity, Georgia, we have Andres. Andres, what have you been up to? What's up? What's up, Kenny? Also playing a ton. Um, not getting as frustrated because, like you said, I've been having a ton of fun. Standard is super, super fresh to me. And every week has felt like a new like a new adventure, pretty much. So I've been super happy with Hearthstone. And I've been playing it as much as I can, as much as my busy week has allowed me. Yeah, of course. We'll probably talk a little bit about our ladder and after we get in introductions done here. But all the way from Oregramar, Illinois, we have Cora. Cora, welcome back. Thanks, Kenny. It's good to be back. All right. You want to start talking about what you've been up to this week with uh, ladder, or have you done anything? Yeah, I mean, I actually took the weekend to sort of overdose at Overwatch, um, <laughs> just because I uh, the only time I played it before this was the second beta test weekend. So I played it for like a day during the beta weekend, um, had a ton of fun with it, and then got into the early open beta, but couldn't actually play all of last week because I've been in school and it's just been really, really busy. So I took the weekend to just sort of play some Overwatch. Um, Really, really loved it, but now I'm back to Hearthstone. And yeah, I've just been testing a bunch of different things, Um, getting into Rogue, which I've never really uh, played too much of before, so that's been really fun. Yeah, just really enjoying it. Yeah, actually, I, I picked up some uh, some rogue of, just in casual play, just because I wanted to see how the uh, the uh, new rogue styles. Up. We'll get to talking about it later, but uh, so I played a little bit of rogue in casual, and I'm playing a lot of uh, warlock lately. I'm I think I'm 13 or 14 wins away from golden, so almost there. And yeah, so. I've had a couple of cool win streaks. I had a 10 game win streak and a six game win streak. So uh, I think since last game last week I was 15. I'm at nine now. So that's what I've been doing lately. And uh, what what about you, Andres? What have you been uh, doing on ladder lately? Playing. I have been playing a Yoxeron mage that is working out quite nicely. I saw Ty's playing a version of it. It's like the traditional. Tempo mage style with the flame wakers and like the huge like early game aggression and stuff, but then you use I can't remember what the name of him is, but it's a six mana mage card that is a five five that summons uh, three mana a card. three a three mana card. What's his Faceless name? Faceless summoner. Yeah. Faceless summoner. That card is really good. And uh, it turns out that Yaxaran, it's actually quite nice in this deck because you're already by default casting so many spells. And then um, usually you don't need Yaxaran to win, but the times that you do find yourself behind in, with this deck, like everything is lost, you have no more hand, your board is gone, and you're like, all right, well, here you go, Yog, do your thing. Hello, <laughs> and you'll be surprised how many times Yog comes through and saves you. <laughs> nice. And Cinder, what have you been up to? What have, I, I got to catch a couple of your games. What have, what have you been playing? Oh, yeah, you saw that... Um, that uh dragon priest that i have spiked with nizaf on the top end that's a funny deck to play because you sit there playing you know mid-range dragon taunt 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 lots of board value chill maw things like that they think they're doing great they've removed all your threats and then blam nizaf comes down thumb summons chill maw sylvanas and like two owen uh, uh Deathwing, Dragon Lord, and like one other death, uh, death rattle, and it's just like twenty-eight damage on the board, and they just can't do anything about it. It's hilarious, but it takes forever to play. Um, nice. But that I'm playing that because I started playing the Nizoth Paladin that has been doing well in tournaments. Holy cow! I love that deck, man. It's really good. It's been really good to me, and it's it's been the cure to my kind of like insane meta blues because it's so consistent. I agree with that. That deck is super strong. I get I got to play it a lot last week before Dreamhack and stuff because 
it just felt so strong and i remember climbing from like 15 to 8 in, uh, in just like a couple days with that deck it was really really strong i haven't played it myself yet but i've watched a lot of it and i've played against a ton of it um, <laughs> it I think feels I bad into, playing against it sometimes like, i read into like four in a row playing melee rogue today um and melee rogue does a ton of burst damage but like it it, it peaks out you can't quite deal 30 you need to get some in there earlier with some minions mm -hmm. um and the forbidden healing just you know 20 extra health who cares lay on hands oh second forbidden healing why not you <laughs> can't you can't kill them it's yeah that, so it has a ton of sustain yeah cool now, well it's good to hear what you guys do on the week because i know we don't tend to talk to each other sometimes and i'm sure our listeners like to know what we play too so that's a nice little insight uh i do want to cover a couple things before we get into our news and then our tournament results. But uh, I do want to make a couple announcements. So if, I, I don't know if I mentioned this on last episode, but we are now on Google Play Music. So all of those Android users can now, just like iTunes on iPhones and uh, all those, you can go and find us on the Google Play Music. So go check us out. Uh, also, come join us at our Discord. So discord.coinconcede.com. You'll get an invite there. Uh, we'd love to talk to talk about it. I've actually, uh, Chandra, I just witnessed uh, get her 500 Hunter win. So it's nice to see some people yeah, in there. Congrats. Congrats. And uh, yeah, come join us. We'd love to chat with you, see what you're, you're playing, you know, keep in touch. Uh, I'm in there all the time. Syndra's in, all, in there all the time. Yep. Uh, Andres is in there sometimes <laughs> when he's playing. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah. I've been there like twice. You know. <laughs> you on, Cora. You've got school. You're I'm almost done with school. So, I gotta yeah. step up my game. My Discord game's weak. <laughs> All right. So, and also, like, literally right after our show, we had uh, a new Patreon donor, and his name is Sir Slips. He's in the chat channel right now on Twitch. Uh, thank you so much, Sir Slips. Uh, he, he is now our top donor. Uh, He's a actually, man. Thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah. That's awesome. We do appreciate it very much. Uh, so let me take a, just a moment to kind of go over the different rewards because he, he's our top donor and, and basically we have one of each so far, I think. Uh, we don't have a five. So I'll run through them as quickly as I can. I know you want to actually hear about content. So uh, for $1, if you do $1 uh, a month, I think you could do $1 a month, <laughs> is uh, you get access to our Patreon content and, and a shout out on the show as well as any early... Uh, video on demand, so any VODs like YouTube or Twitch or anything like that. Uh, $2 will get you a, a distinction of Patreon, patron on our Discord uh, if you come join us, and your name will be posted to our website, uh, plus the previous rewards for the $1. Uh, you'll see the that continue here. And a $5 rewards, uh, eligible for giveaway raffles, um, or at giving access to coin concede graphics. Uh, we, we can do that. And then we're actually working on something. I, I will just say we're working on a possible sponsor for the podcast. So hopefully we'll have an announcement mm. soon. Maybe we'll have someone on the show. We'll, we're pretty excited to announce it. So we're just kind of finalizing the details. Uh, next up would be $10, which is, uh, of course, Sir Slips did that lovely donation. It's uh, an invite to our show's private Discord channel and uh, voice chat for topic ideas, different stuff you'd like to do if he just wants to be part of it. Um, and early access to show notes. So, uh, Sir Slips, send me a message. I'm going to make sure that you can get the access and, and all that at the end of the show here. Um, we also have a $25 reward. If you're so generous to do that, we'll go ahead and friend request you, each of us, and, and uh, we can give you a coaching session if you'd like um, with a sp sp specific de deck. God, I can't even speak. Specific deck that you would like to play. <laughs> and then our last one uh, would blow our minds. If you donated $50 uh, a month, uh, we will give you a producer title and mention you on every show as our producer. You, you, you get will... my firstborn child. <laughs> and he already has two, so he can't give it. But I, I, I... The thing I wanted to mention was uh, we actually do have uh, the new stat snapshots for Patreon, so I just want to take a moment there to do that. Uh, so... Yeah. Also, uh, let's go on to... Did we cover everything I wanted to do? I think so. Yeah, let's hop into the news. 
All right, so the first thing I wanted to mention was uh, we actually do have uh, the new stat snapshots for Tempest Tempo Storm. So uh, you guys want to talk about that for a little bit? And then, uh, Cinder, you, I, did you get a chance to check that out? I think you... Yeah, you know what? No surprise. Agro Shaman right at the top. I mean, the Flame Wreath Faceless is just such a monster. You know, 7-7 seven, seven, seven at, at the 4-mana spot. So everybody's been, with the big game hunter kind of slowing down, everybody's trying to figure out how to deal with that minion. And while they do, Agro Shaman's been tearing up the ladder. Zoo didn't lose a step. Zoo's still up at the top. And uh, Nazoth Paladin has uh, found a, a cozy little home up in Tier 1. And I very much agree with that, of course. Great. Yeah, I think the Tier 1 makes sense. The only surprise I'm seeing is... I haven't seen a single Beast Druid on ladder, so I don't know how Beast Druid earned a place in Tier 3, but good for Beast Druid. I've, um, I've actually seen it in tournament play. That's where I've seen it. Have. I was about to say that, yeah. In the tournament I, I talked today, the, the DreamHack tournament, I saw a couple Beast Druids. Yeah, Orange, by the way. He was playing a pretty yep. cool Beast Druid uh, with like some Violet Teachers and stuff, and it seemed like a really solid deck. But I think, yeah, people haven't just not experimented that much with Druid. I think Cthune Druid was kind of like the default uh, archetype people kind of like turn towards. Yeah, for Isn't sure. It? And then, uh, I was just saying, Yogg Mage is in Tier 4. But I, I've had a lot of fun with Yogg Mage. I think Yogg Mage is actually, um, like you were saying, Andres, actually pretty pretty good. Um, yeah. I don't know I what like kind of Yogg Mage they have over here. Because honestly, I don't think it's a Tier 4 deck. I, it was a very successful um ladder deck as far as i was trying it out it's just like the old tempo mage equally strong but yeah. instead of dr boom you put in yoxeron isn't it supposed to be more of like a ladder or is it including temp uh our tournament play as well it's a little bit of both i think but mostly yeah, think ladder mixture. yeah it's it's mostly ladder it might be a different um Yux around mage because there's more of like the controlly with the cabalist it's a, tome style. It's, a, it's got two cabalist tome, flame waker, one faceless summoner. Um, oh yeah, this, yeah, there you go. Flames. It looks, it's it looks a little slower. reasonably standard. Yeah, a little slow. Yeah. All right, so that was a quick little review. Uh, we're trying to get through our news pretty quick so we can get to the tournament and our deck explanation. We're going to hop into a little bit more detail with our uh, decks later in the show here. Um, so we also had a couple new, uh, well, actually a new s whole team. Uh, several people signed up with a new team, uh, and we have a couple friends from there, too. Uh, and it's nice. Uh, Cinder, I'm going to let you go over this since you, you're kind of more the tournament guy. You like to, you know more about the people than I do. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, so Virtus Pro, uh, which is a, a kind of an umbrella group of uh, Russian esports, is a very, very large esports organization over there they decided to finally form a hearthstone team and they have picked up for this team Naaman, dr hippie bunny hopper and faramir they basically scooped up everybody out of the the euro uh, championship that that did super super well uh, and most of these guys or at least half of them are uh, native russian speakers so this is no surprise that they ended up getting in with a regional team but that's a super super strong team right there Pretty excited to see uh, how they start to shape up the, the tournament scene. Yeah, it makes sense. Nyman, I think, is from Kazakhstan. Faramir and Bunnyhopper are both German, actually, I think. Yes. Um, so, But English is, is the common denominator there, so it, it works well. I'm actually uh, reasonably good friends with Faramir. I played Overwatch with him and Bunny the other day. Uh, just great guys. Great guys, really talented. Nyman, of course, had the, uh, uh, the temporary ban for last year, but then came back and proved that it, it meant nothing because then he won uh, Europe. So, yeah, long time coming for these guys. Really, really great to see them together. Yeah, congratulations, our, our German friends. We love you guys. <laughs> All right, so hopping on to the next piece of news here. Old Murkai and Captain's Parrot are no longer quest rewards. Uh, they're going to be dust only now. And also a reminder, uh, this is actually the 9th, so tomorrow on the 10th, uh, there's going to be, uh, we just want to remind you, there's the card disenchantment values that are 100% where you get back all of the dust for the cards that were changed. They're now going back to normal on the 10th. So definitely go check that out. Um, and we have the link in the show notes too. So let me go ahead and pass it off to Cinder for the tournament results. 
Well, thank you very much, Kenny, and thank you to the Hearthstone gods for only having one tournament to have to watch last weekend. <laughs> but thankfully, it was a big one. It was DreamHack Austin, uh, the very, very first DreamHack in the United States, in North America, I believe. And uh, if, if you're not familiar, DreamHack is a very large, very influential uh, esports organization. They, they produce... Uh, esports events, right? They kind of have a touring, a rolling event that goes around. It's previously has been around Europe, but this past weekend, Austin, very first one. And with the DreamHack name comes just a huge wave of interest, and just about everybody showed up to this one. I would uh, say DreamHack itself helped foster the whole like competitive scene that we have today. It's one of those ongoing events that's been going on for a lot of years and it encompasses so many different sports. It's really cool that Hearthstone has become so big in it. And I also think it's so cool that it finally came to the U.S. I'm just sad that I couldn't go there live. <laughs> no kidding, man. I, I Had I the foreknowledge of, you know, of it coming up sooner, I may have even tried to go myself. Uh, so the format for the Hearthstone tournament was four decks and one band, last hero standing, which is kind of the opposite of conquest. That means when you win with a deck, you stick with that deck, and your opponent's deck that lost, that gets knocked out. So you have to, in reverse, you, you might you might win the entire series on one deck. Your opponents, is if they lose, are the ones who have to, has to rot rotate through their lineup. The uh, This was a huge tournament. Nine rounds of Swiss. That's a, that's a lot of games. Uh, but at, at the top of the Swiss uh, bracket, we cut into a 16-slot single elimination tournament. Uh, and when I say just about everybody was there, I just every single team, any team you can name off the top of your head, they probably had at least three to five players there. And plenty of smaller teams sent representatives. And of course, since it's an open tournament, lots of people walked in, you know, representing only themselves. And some of them actually did quite well. Uh, now, I want to get to the top eight. Before I get to the top eight, I kind of want to talk about the people who didn't make top eight. Because this is kind of a, a an amazing list of people who fell out of the round of 16. Listen to this list. Insanity, Super JJ, Zixo, Pavel, Orange, Frozen, and Zelay all got knocked out in the round of 16. So that should tell you how strong of a tournament this was. I mean, that's, that's a crazy list. And to even get into the top 16 of this tournament, you had to have... I believe a seven and two record of Swiss over two yeah. days. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, seven and two was kind of close, I think. Yeah, I think yeah. there might have been one or two six and threes. Just one. One, one six and three. Oh, damn. just one. In fact, it, notably because uh, at position seventeen, based off of tiebreakers, was Osakaka. <laughs> no. Feels bad, man. <laughs> oh, poor Osakaka. Yeah, but I mean. A seven and two record over two days of play means you you pretty much can't falter. Like you can no. have two games where maybe your luck isn't quite great, or two matches where your luck isn't great, but you have to be on top of your game for two full days of play, and that's incredibly difficult to do. Yeah, and not only that, for the amount of games that you have to be playing, your lineup has to not only your play, but your lineup has to be super super solid and it has to match up accordingly with it, what everyone is bringing. And I feel for this tournament. It was so hard to tell what people were bringing because people were bringing the craziest decks. Like, um, decks. yeah, we had like that guy Tars bringing a Summoning Stone Druid, <laughs> which was so actually cool. successful. It actually worked out. It was yeah. so good. <laughs> Zalay actually experimented with it before uh, the tournament and almost brought it himself. They're kind of convinced that it has a shot. Yeah, no, the deck didn't seem too bad. No, not at all. Uh, so here's our actual top eight. We had Terrence M. from Gale Force Esports. He was he was the first one to cut in. Now, and this may not be a name that a lot of people are familiar with, uh, but uh, Terrence has been a, a regular in the Hearthstone community. He's been a regular tournament player, regular ladder player, basically since the beginning. And last year, we had this long stretch of invitational-only tournaments where if you weren't a streamer, or you hadn't had a big tournament finish, you never got your name on uh, on the map. So Terrence M just flew under the radar all of last year, and thanks to 
the open uh, system this year, Terrence and a few other people got in. Uh, Odeman and Vince, who are French players who came along with TARS, uh, they made the top eight. Peyton from Team Celestial, so at least one of that big uh, team of Team Celestial came through. And another player who last year basically flew under the radar but really has deserved some time in the spotlight. He came through. Shockey finally cutting into the top eight again of a tournament. Uh, and then uh, two walk-ons, two non-pros, Jasm and J. Billy B. Gotta love that username. But uh, there you go. Two people out of these eight previous uh, no major Hearthstone tournament experience making the cut once again. I, this is once again just a proof that Blizzard's stance that the open tournament is the way to go for the HCT tour is the was the right way to go. Yeah, I totally agree. This this tournament was so interesting to watch, and it was just a mixture of the top talent next to what what you said, just walk-ons of people that, lucky enough, were close to Austin or could make the trip to Austin and sign up there, sign up the early enough to just be able to play the tournament. Um, I believe that the tournament was also free, right? You only had to pay your entrance fee to the convention, and that mm-hmm. was it. Which makes it even more awesome. Like anyone who can take themselves over there could participate in this tournament. And if you're good enough, if you practice and are ready, yep, you could also be there in the top eight. Yeah, really great things have been said about this tournament so far. Um, it was run really well. The admins were really great. And then just beforehand, all the pros on Twitter were all saying, you know, because of the format, because it's nine rounds of Swiss, it's last hero standing, it's standard, that it's really the best possible setup for the best player to succeed. Um, And I think in this case, the best player did succeed. And some of these guys were so great. There is one thing I want to mention. At the risk of sounding like a gossipy teenage girl, did you guys hear about Insanity? (laughs) I I did hear that. Yes. Yes. You did hear about Insanity. It's Um, hard to to judge those things because it's such a big tournament. Nobody gets policed all the time. I guess if we're going to talk about it, we should first say what's the rumor behind it. Yeah, so Insanity um, was said to have, I believe in a game versus Bloody, who is one of the VS friends, um, was said to have played Shaman and then denied it and ended up winning because of it. Basically, he lied to Edmonds, I think. Several times. That's what it sounded what like. Yeah. yeah. What I heard is he Mr. had lied on two different occasions to get two different wins mm-hmm. that got got him to the round of 16, I think. And then he got swept once uh, once he was live on his match. And then, I don't know, people were saying that, but there's no hard proof about it. And it's kind of like his word against the word of the other players. It's a very slippery slope situation, which... Honestly, what what I think we should take away from that is mo- not, mostly than focusing on him is mostly m- focusing on how can we prevent that on a tournament, especially in this massive scale that is awarding this huge cash prices. Um, there needs to be in place at least a system, or it would be nice if it was part of the client where the tournament mode maybe can just be like a mode where after you finish your match, it just automatically registers and sends to a central server. So there's no way of like faking or there's no need to like third party screenshots or this sort of thing. Um, That would be really nice if Blizzard implemented something like that. Yeah, and the client definitely desperately needs some kind of tournament mode support. As far as the insanity thing, I, I've run and judged a lot of very, very large tournaments at big national conventions. And the one thing that I tell players at the beginning of every single event, don't wait to call a judge. If there's a problem, stop your game, scream, shout, jump up and down, raise your hands, and get an admin over there. Because if you don't and you wait and you wait till after your game is played and the re- it's already been re- reported, it's too late. The admin can't do anything about it because it's your word against your opponent. So you, I think it. So when when you get this kind of situation of a he said she said thing, I just stay out of it because who knows? There's no way to tell. Yeah, there's no way to tell. And for this type of event, you know, it's the judgment call is very hard to make because they have to keep the ball rolling, right? Like the show must go on. Uh, people are waiting. There's a huge. There's a bunch of rounds, so they can't really like go back and wait too much time, um, especially if he has maybe played 
another match already and then my influence of the results later on they're filming they have casters it's a huge production um it's the unfortunate part of the event i guess yeah, no, well, I, I'd most I'd expect maybe a, a moody Reddit post out of it. But all in all, I was really impressed by the event. I think it was a huge, huge success, especially being the first stream hack in the United States. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Without a doubt. So uh, on to uh, the, the big top results that we all want to hear about. It's third and fourth place went to Peyton from Team Celestial and J. Billy B, the walk-on. So really great finish from somebody who came in uh, supported only by himself, and he had a great personality too. He was fun to watch. He was Funny he was man. laughing all the way through most of his games. It was pretty great. And then our final came down to Ch- Miss Chucky, Mister Second Place, Keaton Gill, <laughs> and <laughs> Terrence M. Now, for if, most people probably know about this, but if you're new to the tournament <laughs> scene, Chucky is a very pro- prolific tournament player. He's been playing since the beginning, and he's notorious for getting second place. He'll do great, make top eight, and then totally wash out in the final. Well, this time, no longer, everybody. Chucky finally pulls down a win, 3-2 to two versus Terrence M. And, and all credit to Terrence M. Like I said, he's been flying under the radar for too, too long. He deserved some limelight, and he had an outstanding tournament, one game away from taking away the whole thing. And the, 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 that final match was really something, too, because Chucky is very well known for being an aggressive player, loves to take things like face hunter and aggro shaman and just, you know, smirk face every single time, mm-hmm. right? And that, in, in a way, that has kind of been what's kept him out of the, the, the top seat because those... Those aggressive decks, if you don't draw right, then they, they will just fall hard, right? And he just, bad luck will just hit you eventually. So in this tournament, he his lineup was mostly control decks. Uh, he had a Nazoth Paladin, uh, which was his primary deck that carried him through most of the tournament. And all every time he was on stream, control, 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 control. Very different Chalky than what we've yeah. seen before. But in the final match, he's down... One game to two. So he's lost both of his control decks that he had. So he's he has to flip to his other deck, which really hadn't been seen much, if at all. It was a Warlock Zoo, and it was a very aggressive Warlock Zoo. And let me tell you, it was kind of like that scene in The Princess Bride where the Man in Black and Inigo Montoya are having their duel on the Cliffs of Insanity, and, it, <laughs> and Inigo says, there's something you should know. I am not I left-handed. Am not left-handed. It is Kind of like Chucky going, there's something you should know, Terrence. I am not a control player. <laughs> Throws down that Warlock deck and just tears him apart. It was really something to watch. But in the movie, the Men in Black isn't left-handed either. And he it, comes back I, for the win. This time, though, we gave it to an ego. No, Chucky, <laughs> one of the most well-respected players in the game. Yes, he. he everybody jokes about him being you know, an, an aggro player, a smork player. Um, but... I think it was something like he's made top four nine times in like invites and large tournaments, and he was the odds-on favorite to win uh, North American Championships last season, and then didn't even make it out of groups. So that upset, I think, just just fueled his determination for this. And uh, yeah, I, I I was happy. I was I was cheering for him on watching on my phone on my couch. Uh, yeah, he. <laughs> Definitely, definitely deserves it. Terrence is a great player, too, though. So it really could have been anybody. I was actually really impressed by Terrence's play. I, I saw a lot of his matches before the final, and he was making some really, really good calls and really good decisions, like, overall. Uh, I hadn't seen him play before, so to me, it was kind of a surprise, kind of like watching this guy playing so well and defeating all the pros. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's an aspiring pro himself, and like I said, he's he, he really has deserved uh, a big tournament finish. And second place, just one game away from the from first place, it's, he's got to be super happy about that anyway. But there's one other player I want to note, and this is a little bit of personal pride. There is one player in the brackets by the name of Appa, and Appa is a local to me. He is actually one of my play group. Uh, and in in the very first round, he swept Muzzy 3-0 and went on to go 6-3, and three, missing the cut for top 16 by just three spots. So 
That is a great, great finish for him. I'm super proud of him. Uh, and he, he's now doing coaching uh, full time. So I'll, I'll I'll talk about that later. But yeah, oh, that's really nice. Well, that's super, off anyway. super proud of a, of a local being able to to rep our little tiny little play group, our tiny little pond over here and do so well. Mm-hmm. Hope he, hopefully he's listening. Yeah, uh, congrats. If you are listening, congrats. Congratulations. <laughs> I'll make him download this episode. <laughs> <laughs> so now, since I only had one tournament to talk about, I can talk a little bit of numbers. He popular off. too. Yeah, Nazoth Paladin, very, very strong showing. Uh, it was taken in a lot of decks. And Miracle Rogue, um, not seen on ladder very much, but the pros has really tend to like this deck a lot. Um, almost it, Of those three decks, almost every list had at least one or more of those decks. So that's a strong indication that the tournament players are gravitating towards these three classes and those four archetypes, taking in a lot of decks. And Miracle Rogue, um, not seen on ladder very much, but the pros has really tend to like this deck a lot. Um, almost it, Of those three decks, almost every list had at least one or more of those decks. So that's a strong indication that the tournament players are gravitating towards these three classes and those four archetypes as being the go-to for competitive play. There are also a decent amount of Aggro Shaman and uh, t- Patron Warrior, which is kind of evolving into like a Tempo Warrior. It's a little less combo-y, a little more uh, on curvy, and it's been doing pretty well. Uh, the big winners, percentage-wise, for the weekend, Warlock of both varieties won 61% of their matches, so super, super strong. Nazoth Paladin right behind it at 60%. Both of those decks. I mean, we talk about sixty percent before. That's a that is an extremely good win rate. It doesn't it doesn't seem like much, but trust me, guys, this is this is a very consistent number of wins. And then the patron tempo warrior coming in at about fifty four and some decimal points percent. Those were the big winners. And then one one lonely hunter was taken in the entire <laughs> tournament. <laughs> Thank you, Kranich, for at least trying with my my poor beloved Hunter. <laughs> Don't worry, <laughs> we, we will we will bring it back from the ashes soon enough. The Hunter will have its day once again. It was on top for so long; you can't help but feel a little bit vindicated that you're like, yeah, yeah Hunter finally yeah. knows what it feels like. <laughs> It'll just It'll feel be. that much better when you do bring it back, though. You know, <laughs> like yeah, or you you're that one that does get it popular again. So I was going to say, I'm curious to see if this statistic is actually going to change at all. Because so far from what I've seen, the latter, hunters are not really there. The tournament scene, hunters haven't really been there. And the expansion has been out for a couple of weeks. And honestly, I've played a little bit of hunter. And the variants that I've tried playing haven't felt as strong as some of the other decks that I've been playing and you can do a lot of stuff with Call of the Wild, and Princess Huhuran sometimes has his moments, but in, in all in all, I'd rather be playing something else at this time. So I'm just curious to see if uh, maybe we just really need to revise the way we're playing Hunter, or like we haven't really experimented that much, or maybe Hunter is really a class that is going to get it shoved a little bit um, during these times. We shall see. Yeah, that was a good uh, report for that. Um... I know you only had one uh, tournament, but the, hey, that's one hell of a tournament. So it was. You want to let us know of any upcoming ones? Uh, just two, very quickly. Now these are invitationals; they're not part of the championship tour. However, they they mix regions, which is why I'm at least excited to watch these. The Star Ladder and I series, the Star Ladder and I Le- the Star Ladder and I series Star League. I think they did that on purpose. <laughs> This is an invitational uh, with a group stage that breaks into a top eight. Uh, the top eight's going to be two Chinese players and six world players. So that's going to be fun. Uh, and then there's the – that's in about a week. And then there's the China versus Europe championship, which is – it's it's billed as a team tournament. But what it really is is it's, uh, it's much the same thing. It's two group of limb stages that break into a top eight afterwards. And that starts in about two weeks. It's – Anytime uh, you, you get to see metas mixing, it's sure to be a fun time to watch. So uh, I got links to those in the show notes. Go check them out if you're uh, if you're curious to see what's going on in both of those foreign metas. Great. I'm going to wrap this up with uh, our iTunes thank you this week. So we did have an iTunes review with the US of A. 
and it was East Pointer. Uh, he did mention, I, I'm going to mention this only because I'm not part of it, but uh, after, after a month hiatus, Cohen can see his back end as on, and as on point as ever. Uh, the new hosts, Andres and Cinder, have really brought a very extensive knowledge to the show and have been an all-star addition to the show. From card reviews to explanations of advanced game mechanics to updates of the latest tournaments, they covered all. One of my favorite podcasts and a solid filler for my week, work week. Uh, thank you so much for leaving a review. We do love uh, mentioning at least once a, one a week, and I'm glad you were this week. Uh, again, if you're in other countries and you're listening, definitely leave a, a review. We'll be able to mention it on the show, too. Um, yeah, I'm that thinking about an awesome adding... review, though. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm glad that Cinder and me are not just babbling incoherent stuff over here. People, <laughs> people actually find it useful. <laughs> That's why I'm taking more of a silent role, too. I mean, I'd rather... <laughs> keep track of the the show and do this behind the scenes stuff um but yeah hey thank you a lot we, we really do appreciate it uh, I'm, I'm thinking about making something a little bit easier to for our listeners to figure out how they could leave uh reviews making a different page on our website or something we'll see uh and again if you're on stitcher leave a review i don't think you can leave re- reviews yet on google P- music play uh maybe they'll implement that later but we'll, we'll see uh so yeah Oh, you can always find the links on our show notes, and some some players you can actually directly click on the links uh, on the lyrics part of our podcast. So definitely check that out. Uh, let's go ahead and start our explanation segment. All right. So first thing I do want to mention, uh, we have a couple questions, at least one uh, for later in the show. Uh, that was for live on the show during today. But if you feel like writing in during the week when you're listening and we're not live, you can always write into the show at our email at coinconceit at gmail.com and uh, leave a little little something, a little short something. that will make it too long. <laughs> All right, Andres, uh, you want to go ahead and start with the explanation? Kind of yeah, intro is to it. Let's do it. Uh, we thought it would be a good idea to talk about some of those top decks that we just mentioned about during the tournament. Um, mainly Miracle Rogue, Nusoth Paladin, Patron Warrior, and Agro Shaman, since they're the ones who are at the top of the tier list on meta, the meta snapshot. And they also perform really well in DreamHack, so <clears throat> it's pretty worthwhile talking about them. Let's talk about uh, Rogue at first, the, the Miracle Rogue. Um, Miracle Rogue... It's a deck that is characterized by having very strong and very cheap removal, and it allows it to propel into a very solid mid-game with um, the Gadgets and Auctioneer being like their main draw engine. And the Gadgets and Auctioneer tends to be very reliable in this deck, allowing the deck to draw an immense amount of cards, um, letting them get away with combo-like win conditions, and so far, when we have seen, there has been a lot of variations on this win condition, depending on the player and the style. Some people like creating really big Van Cleaves and then concealing them to just hit the opponent a couple times. Some other people like the Leroy Faceless with Cold Bloods kind of thing to do like a big burst finisher. And for DreamHack, we actually saw a lot of the Malago-style Miracle Rogue where they're just trying to get Malagos, conceal it, and then deal a ton of damage um, next turn with a ton of spells. And I th- believe they add Thorazan as well to kind of like help them fuel um, the deck a little better. It's a very strong deck. It's also, like you said, Cinder, not a deck that you see a lot on the ladder. And I believe it's because it's not the easiest deck to pilot out there. It actually requires a lot of planning, and um, it requires you to know your matchups really well and what you're going to be facing against because the deck does run out of steam soon if you use up everything too early or at the wrong times and if you don't draw your action here you might find yourself in trouble so it's all about pacing and um, being able to keep your opponent in check until you can take over the board with your what's the name of that card the 5-4 that with the threat will get a coin into your the hand. Tomb Pillager. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Tomb Pillagers. They love the Tomb Pillagers, and I can that card that synergizes a lot with the Auctioneer and allows you to cycle even more. Uh, they have Asher Drakes. 
<clears throat> they have Cyril of the Poison Mind. So basically, from turn four on, you start um, developing the scary creatures that can present a threat for your opponent. Um, so yeah, you're looking to keep your opponent in check, tempo into the mid game, and draw into your combo win condition with the Auctioneer. It's easier said than done, but the deck is super, super strong if you spend the time and learn it up and down. So the the linchpin of that deck is the Gadget Zen Auctioneer. And I think a, the question that a lot of people have is, if I'm playing against it, how do I deal with it? How, do, how does a person deal with Like, they, they drop the Auctioneer, they maybe draw a couple cards, and then stealth, they conceal the, the Auctioneer. How, does, how do you deal with the Auctioneer at that point? There's very few decks that can deal with the Auctioneer, and that is why uh, I think Miracle is so strong right now with the uh, stealth mechanic. As far as I know, the only decks that can properly deal with it easily is the Nassoth Paladin, for example, that controls Stealth Paladin with the Equality Consecrate or Equality Pyromancer, which completely ignores um, the Stealth. You can do it with Flame Strike. Um, that sort of AoE, like if the AoE is strong enough, you might be able to do it. But aside from that, there's not many other ways that you can deal with a Stealth at Auctioneer. Yeah, Deadly Shot comes to mind if you can isolate yeah, the, the Auctioneer. If you're playing Hunter, yeah. if you're mm. the unlucky guy playing Hunter right now. <laughs> <laughs> brawl, if you've got it, you can occasionally brawl. get lucky. But yeah. if you brawl, brawl and but limbs, then you're just, fire. Yeah, broken you're just backfire done. quite a bit. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's even important to point out that Miracle Rogue doesn't doesn't even really need the conceal. So I'm playing a Malagos-type Miracle Rogue, which is still heavily reliant on gadgets, and, but it doesn't have... Um, it doesn't have conceals. It has no stealth. So essentially, you Tharus on your cards, and then you just play Gadgets in on the same turn as you know using the coins from the Tomb Pillager or preparation into the cheap spells, and it works. You don't always need to have that Gadgets in for two turns. Most of the time, one turn is enough, and then you go into Malagos, you know, the next turn or turn eight if you get the discount. Turn nine. Um, it's just an incredibly versatile deck that's been around since. The beginning of Hearthstone, which I think is a testament to how strong it really is. It is, it is. And you're right, the deck doesn't need Conceals to work. Conceal is a card that they've been trying out for a while. And in all honesty, if you play the Auctioneer at the right time, you draw enough cards so that if, even if your opponent gets rid of the Auctioneer, the damage kind of has already been done. And you've already, like, you already got what you needed from him. Uh, really quick... This deck is really, really good against mid-range style of decks and can be really good against control style of decks as well. Um, mainly mid-range, just because your tempo tools really, really allow you to stay ahead in these decks. Um, let's say a mid-range Shaman that plays out the the Faceless 7-7 seven, seven on turn 4 and you can just sap it right back. Or a Druid that double innervates a big taunt and you can just sap it right back. Um, this sort of decks are you're great against them because you can keep them at bay really easily. Um, same against control, they give you usually enough of a window of opportunity for you to um, build up into a big auctioneer turn, turn, get everything you need, and just burst them out, um, and you're able to keep up the pressure against them. And decks that you're gonna struggle against a little bit are the really, really insane fast aggro, like the aggro shaman that just go for you right out the gate. Um, unfortunately, with as the rogue, the deck is jam-packed with everything you need, and there's almost no room for heals aside from maybe like one, sometimes two Earthen Ring Farseers, but that is usually not enough to stop um, super fast aggro, so just watch out for that if you're trying to take that this out and uh, to spit into the ladder. Great. Shall we move on to the next one? I think the next one was going to be covered by uh, Cora. No, uh, Cinder. Yeah, yes. Cinder. Cinder's got the palette in there. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so the 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 one that we've been talking about, the Nazoth Paladin. Uh, we are. Ooh, let me pull that one up on the screen. There we go. Uh, this is Chucky's list that we have uh, linked in the show notes and on screen if you're live. Uh, so the Nazoth Paladin is a control deck. Uh, and, and this control deck wins specifically by drawing out the game, stalling, removing big threats, uh, exhausting all of your opponent's cards and resources 
almost to the point of exhaust, almost to the point of fatigue. Maybe they just have a few cards left in hand in a deck. And once they've run out of steam, you drop Nazath and generate this huge board of unstoppable uh, minions, primarily Tyrion Forgering, uh, and usually Sylvanas and Cairn. Uh, but uh, a lot of decks are running one or two of the uh, Corrupted Healbot as well. Uh, so, you know, you drop 20 plus attack on the board in the end game, and what are they going to do? Um, so it has really super, super good matchups against other control decks, which is one of the reasons why it's so consistent in tournaments right now. Tournaments tend to be slower than ladder. You, you, you have more mid-range, more control, fewer aggro. Uh, and when you have a meta that's saturated with control, a control deck that can beat other control decks usually ends up rising to the top. Uh, and the reason it's so good about against other control is just because of the the saturation of threats. They have to deal with all those big bodies twice. They they deal with Tyrion, they deal with Sylvanas, they deal with Cairn, and maybe they deal with those two Hillbots, and then they got to deal with them again at the end of the game. And a lot of control decks don't have that much removal to deal with it. You know, we talked uh, in other conversations and other episodes about recursion, the power of recursion, the power of returning a card into play once it's already been played. And the fact that Nazoth's recursion generates upwards of like 30 mana worth of cards on the board in one turn is incredible. Um, it's also very good against mid range decks mostly because of the efficient board clears that this Paladin deck runs. You know, it, it, uh, Andres mentioned the, the Equality Consecrate, Equality Wild Pyromancer. Uh, these are very strong clears that they can trigger multiple times throughout the game. So if they, somebody drops a big wave of, of mid-range min minions or maybe a big wave of patrons, they just get wiped out immediately. I would say that um, out of all the decks that I've tried so far in the expansion, this Nusoth Paladin seems to me like one of the more consistent ones that I've had like the chance of trying out. Um, I feel comfortable going into almost every matchup with this deck, <clears throat> and I feel that I have a good chance against any deck that I'm playing against. Just because, like you said, there's so many board clears. You even include two Doomsayers in there, which yes. have become mm -hmm. like the new MVP two drop of this expansion. With like Shaman running wild with all this like high stat minions, and Sue just overwhelming the board by turn three. Um, just that turn two. Doomsayer, you're not playing anything on your next turn, and you get initiative of the next turn is just so strong. It feels so strong in this deck. Um, one of the things I was going to say about it is that the only times that uh, I've run into a problem with this deck, and I feel like is like the way that people are trying to beat it, is forcing the Paladin into a turn where they have to choose to heal or to remove. If you, if you manage to do this, if your board is threatening enough where the Paladin is like, crap, I need to heal or remove the board, but can't do both at the same time, that's when you might get a chance against this deck. But if you try to play the long game against this deck, you're going to have a bad time. Yeah, that's that's one of the skill uh, choices that you see when you're playing this this deck a lot. Is that it, In fact, it feels like uh, the old Paladin from World of Warcraft, you know, where you're... You just you're fighting, 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 running low, running low, running low, and then you got to make that decision of do I keep fighting or do I hit this big heal? Uh, and this mm -hmm. deck does pack a lot of healing. Uh, I think Forbidden Healing was uh, kind of underestimated by a lot of people doing card mm -hmm. reviews. It ended up being a key, crucial card to this deck, uh, just because of what Andres is talking about, where it rides really low, really risky low health totals, and then has to heal really quick to get back in the game. Um, now it. As far as those bad matchups go that, that Andres was talking about, combo decks give this deck just headaches because you get to those low point totals where you're trying to make that skill decision of do I heal you know, or do I remove. Uh, suddenly a bunch of damage comes out of hand or onto board with a charge minion, you know, like a Leroy power overwhelming, mm -hmm. something like that. And you're dead before you get a chance to get that swing turn. Uh, so you got to be really super careful about those. Rogue decks, Warlock decks, really dangerous uh, and the the other thing that's that's tricky about this deck is that the board clears are all two two card combos for the most part. Uh, Doomsayer may be the the lone exception, but a lot of times you have to time that well because opponent if it's too late in the game, your opponent can just deal with it, which may not be a bad thing because um, it yeah, ends up kind of like being heal seven, right? Uh, but still, it's it 
the timing of the clear of the board clears and the combination board clears mean that if you don't have them in hand at the right time, you can get overwhelmed very quickly. Uh, so you gotta when you gotta know your matchup super well and know how to mulligan. So if you're seeing against an aggressive deck, you know you're about to hit a flood of minions. Make sure you dig aggressively for that doomsayer for sure, and then right behind that an equality, and then plus something else, and nothing else matters because you just need to survive that early game. Yeah, definitely. Like Andre said, one of the most consistent decks, if not the most consistent, to come out of uh, Old Gods. I think maybe we could argue that the new Zoo list is also pretty consistent, yeah. um, as well as Agro Shaman. But this, I would say, is also the most consistently frustrating to play against. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just because you always have to be so prepared for everything. Um, you know, you're not just worried about a quality consecration, you're worried about the quality Wild Pyromancer, you're worried about Doomsayer not being able to handle it. They, they have so much AoE potential, which is really what sets the Nazoth Paladin apart from the Nazoth Rogue which can deal really well with single target removal, but not with AoE now that Blade Flurry's been nerfed and nobody's really playing it. The, the Nazoth Rogue just seems so much weaker in comparison to this Paladin deck that can uh, remove minions, put out large minions every turn, and then you know come back in the late game with all that healing and then just slam Nazoth to bring back Tyrion, Karen, Sylvanas, all of those huge minions, plus Rag Light Lord. Really, really solid. And oh, super solid. Big game super important. Home. Oh, so good. Yeah, yeah like you said, this deck just seems to have it all, right? It has huge board wipes, it has single target removal, it has threats all over the place, and it has a huge comeback mechanic with heals and Nusoth. I mean, double Aldar Peacekeeper, double Keeper of Uldaman, occasionally Humility. Like, you're not worried about single target, you're not worried about big boards because you've got all that AoE. The only thing is it can consistently play really only one minion per turn. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's, you know, where the aggressive decks come in and can sort of run it down before it has the opportunity to set up. It's definitely a long game deck, um, very mm -hmm. similar to the control warriors of old. But yeah, just... The, the other thing I love about the, uh, the single target removal that Paladin picks up is that it's, you, you hit that, that uh, Alder Peacekeeper or the Humility, and then you drop the, the Stampede and Kodo. Oh, and so yeah. You, You've removed a huge target off the board, and then you've played possibly two bodies behind it, which is a mm -hmm. great, great tempo swing for this deck. Absolutely. Cool. That probably covers the Nusoth Paladin. That's a pretty extensive talk about it. It's a really good deck, though. Recommend it for everyone who is trying a new control deck. Mm -hmm. Probably not me because I'm not a control player. But <laughs> I would you will play spend that. a lot of time on matches. I will tell you I, that. I will be playing probably more tournament decks because. I'm going to see if I can work out like a little lineup. We'll see. Uh, but, Corey, you want to go ahead and talk about uh, the Warrior deck? Yeah, so unlike Nazoth Paladin, Patron Warrior is pretty much nothing new. Um, we've been dealing with the pains of Patron Warrior since Warsong Commander was, you know, actually Warsong Commander and not uh, Wars Raid Leader. Um, so Patron Warrior has consistently been... Um, one of the strongest mid-range type decks in uh, the meta. So it is still very much effective. I think it's tier two on the meta snapshot um, for this week, but I would expect to see it jumping up really, really consistent still. Um, so in, in case you guys don't know, the uh, goal of Patron Warrior is to flood the board with Grim Patron combos in the mid game, and then you back it up with strong card draw in the form of Battle Rage, um, Acolyte of Pain, and then board players, you've got Whirlwind, you've got the new um, Ravaging Ghoul, which deals uh, one damage to all minions on the board. Then you've got occasionally a Brawl attack, so just really strong, um, fast deck removal. Uh, and then secondary threats like Frothing Berserker, which can grow out of hand very, very quickly, and Gromish Hellscream, which I find ends the game, you know, eight times out of ten when I'm playing Patron Warrior. You don't need to kill your opponent with Patrons. You just need Averaging Ghoul. Literally, all of those activators make your Grom a 10 or 12 damage. Sorry, we're having a bit of some uh, sound issues there. You're cutting Are in you a little bit of Cora. Oh, am I? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. I don't know if you're far away from the mic or something. Yeah. Yeah, just maybe, maybe get closer to the mic, maybe. It's recording okay on my end. It might honestly be Skype. Or yeah, yeah, Skype it is sounds terrible. like an internet thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Sorry about that, Sorry. guys. No, no worries. Yeah, uh, so good matchups for Patron Warrior. Uh, really great against other mid range decks because of the explosive tempo swing in the mid game. Oh, no. Am I gone again? <laughs> Uh, it's weird. It's like he just fade out. out for a little bit and then yeah. come back in. Okay, because I get this like really intense buzzing whenever I start. Oh wow! Oh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You just win again. That's so weird. Yeah, it's like when you talk for a prolonged period of time. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Can you try just leaning in a little bit forward? Maybe it's your mic that became up. I don't think it's my mic. This is very strange. No, because it's just. Yeah, but we oh, hear you a lot better. Water. Yeah. We hear you better, but yeah. it still goes in and out. It still goes in and out. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, I'm going to lean into it. this really fast. Okay. <laughs> talk really fast. Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry, guys. This guy be, is doing his thing right now. Like, well, really good against Zoo decks. Um, <laughs> very good against Hunters and other aggressive decks because patrons propagate, as that's admirable and Chalky like to say, uh, propagate those patrons. Bad matchups, weaknesses, loses hard to many control decks. Awful, awful against things with large removal, like Resolve Paladin, like Control Warrior. Um, efficient AoE and spot removal for Frothing Berserkers. Bad News Bears uh, makes Patron Warrior sad. But still, really solid deck choice. Um, definitely up there with Control Warrior as being the number one Warrior deck right now. But Warrior overall, just a really consistent class at the moment. So I would Patron say Warrior that Patron is, is like a little bit ahead of the Control Archetype right now. Because the Control Archetype kind of lost a lot. With the shield maidens being gone, and they kind of like rely on the soth being like their main shell right now. The well, patron tempo warrior thing is is pretty cool. I uh, um, I think patron maybe maybe a little bit more. Yeah, Patreon oh, seems no. super, super strong right now. I don't know, especially with all the Sue running around and with some of the rogues running around that can't really deal with the patrons very efficiently. And one of my favorite things about the new patron right now is the Ravaging Ghoul. I think that card is so amazingly good for oh, this yeah. archetype especially because before you had all these whirlwind effects that would create really good effects for you, but outside from the effects like you you had to had secondary cards to make these effects worthwhile but now you have the whirlwind effect attached to a 3-3 body which turns out to be like a pretty decent body for just three mana that can trade with a lot of other things so you're not losing tempo and at the same time activating all these other cool abilities from your acolytes the new uh blood hoof brave which is an absolutely good card um, your patrons, and then battle raging everything, getting a bunch of cards back. Um, I think patron is super, super strong as a mid-range deck right now. Yeah, I would argue that Ravaging Ghoul is overstated for what it does. It really, it really is. Yeah, I mean, like, Whirlwind is one mana, and so essentially that means you're getting 3-3 three, three worth of stats for two mana. So if it had been a three mana 2-2 two, two with a Whirlwind attached, I think we'd still see it get some play, but it's so, not. It's somebody three, in three. Team 5, like, really, really likes mm -hmm. Patron Warrior, and they were like, no, no. <laughs> we're keeping this archetype alive, guys. <laughs> we're going to give you a good free drop. We're going to give you more damage and more activators. Just deal with it. Yeah. Just them saying, whoops, we're sorry about Warsong, Commander. Here you go. And Blood Hoof Brave up. seems like it fits so well into the deck as well, because with Patron, yeah. you never really had, like, a... Like a taunt that you really wanted to run, but this guy just like slots in perfectly in that deck. Yeah, because there's so many things that damage your own minions, almost every single minion in the deck benefits from being damaged. So that Ravaging Ghoul just fits right in. And that Bloodhoof Brave is quite often a 4 mana 5 5 taunt and is a super, super strong taunt in the early game uh, or the later yeah. early game. So I really. I, I really enjoy the deck, honest. I've been whenever I see a lot of zoo on the ladder, I queue up that patron warrior and just feels so good. good. Or even that agro paladin. I love playing against agro yes. paladins with patron warrior. There's a lot of that today. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Let's go ahead and move on to our last deck, which is uh, Frozen's agro shaman. Uh, I'll go ahead and link it in the uh, show notes here, real quick. And uh, yeah, so uh, it's an agro agro archetype and the uh, main win conditions would be 
Well, basically, it's quick. Uh, you have an early ramp of quality minions, uh, and then you end it pretty much with high damage finishers like the Doom Hammer Rock Biter combo, uh, Lava Burst, so spell damage that could just bypass Taunt that you may run into more with this release than before. Um, some notable changes that uh, are in this type since the release is the Eternal Sentinel is by far the most beneficial card. <laughs> it's worth paying oh, the man, dust yeah. to get. Definitely worth getting. Uh, I think we there used to be two Lava Shocks, but now there's only one. So now you have three ways of clearing all of your overload. It's just quality, quality. And, and in that case, I think uh, they added the elemental destruction which is the like an an aoe for this type of deck to kind of give it a little bit of footing in in the later game uh so just a couple little notations there with a little differences that have worked out really well for me and uh some of the good matchups would be like most mid-range decks and it's usually f uh like a faster uh, to its win condition than it is for the uh, mid-range decks. Uh, I've had some good uh, control deck. I don't know if it's just who I'm playing against or if I'm used to playing it, but uh, I've had some awesome games against control. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I, I'm not. Yeah. I'm like 50-50 with it. It's not. It's not bad against control, but it's. This it deck, could be is, just a deck. It's actually can be really good against control, just because you force your opponent to have the answers, and if they don't then you you win. You just take advantage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any other good matchups you want to mention? Oh, that's cool. um, you're right. Any any deck that it can outrace is is what you're looking for. Uh, and it, Andres hit the hit it on the head there. In fact, there was a game uh, in the in the winter preliminaries for NA uh, admirable, and I think it was VLPS. Uh, we're we're in a match, and it was match point for for admirable. And he loaded up that aggro shaman, and literally had the perfect minion on every single turn. It was um, tunnel trog into the the totem golem into you know something for one damage, and the flame tongue totem, and then four, five, six were all burn spells. And he killed him in five turns, and it's like he, he could literally do nothing. Yeah, and just that's watch admirable like burn him down. Honestly, yeah, yeah. this deck is the the new version of what the Agra Hunter used to be. There will yeah. always be one of these decks in Hearthstone, and basically the whole purpose of this deck is to raise your opponent as fast as possible. You're not trying to control the board. In fact, uh, I'm not a huge fan of the decks that add elemental destruction into the sort of deck, because... It's so it's sort of like deviating from the plan, right? With this sort of deck, you're never trying to regain back the board. Honestly, if you say if you lose the board and you don't have enough enough burst damage in your hand, you probably deserve to lose the match. Um, anyway, if you're playing this type of deck, but what you're doing is you're stacking all of your odds into having the most amazing early game that would will not allow your opponent to catch up fast enough that's why you run so many one drops and two drops you never want to miss a one drop on this deck you will never want to miss a two drop and you want to keep your opponent kind of behind the, the removal and cards like um feral spirits and um the totem golem do that because they're hard to remove with just a single card so most of the time it takes two sometimes like a card and a hero power so it's resource intensive to remove your cards and while your opponent is busy trying to just get the pressure out of the way you just keep pumping keep pumping and by the time your opponent stabilizes you should have enough damage to just burst him down um it's a very aggressive deck it's a very efficient deck very effective at what it does all the cards in here are meant to deal a ton of damage to your opponent's face it's super solid yeah, even with the loss of Crackle, essentially with this deck, if you draw well, you will win. If you draw okay and your opponent draws meh, you will still probably win. And even if you draw badly, you can still win because there's so <laughs> many fail-safes. I mean, Double Lava Burst, uh, Doomhammer Rockbiter, Feral Spirits is so, so, so strong. It, it just... It's the deck that gives you the most opportunities to cheese wins when you shouldn't win. 
Absolutely. <laughs> that is exactly what you're trying to do with this. Like you're trying to cheese wins. You're trying to bypass your opponent's win condition, your opponent's removal, your oppo everything your opponent might try to aim at you, you're just trying to ignore all that and kill them before they can even have a chance to do that on you. I would say the enemy of this deck is not being able to get a foothold on the board early on. If you miss that one drop or you miss that two drop or your opponent manages to... Um, stabilize the board before you're able to get a few points of damage in with your minions, you will probably lose this game. If your opponent has minions on the board and you have to spend some of your removal just so you can stick a minion on your board, you're probably going to do very bad. So it very much hinges on the fact that you have to outpace your opponent every turn. And if you can't do that, you will probably lose. Hey, you know, they lost Crackle, but they gained a 4-mana 7-7, seven, seven, so I don't think Just anybody's about crying. about evens out. <laughs> yeah. yeah now, I mean... A note mm -hmm. on, one, one little note on Elemental Destruction. The purpose of that card is for after you have equipped Doomhammer and you have lost the board, you drop Elemental Destruction to give you a couple of turns to push in that Doomhammer damage and hopefully the Rockbiter as well. Yeah, it, it really depends on the matchup, too. Like, it, it's understanding... Who you're playing against, what you're, uh, you know, like I like I mentioned on the last show. Actually, I played a 16 turn uh, game against a control priest, right, and I still won. So it's one of those things where you understand who you're playing against and know what you're going to play and, and what your win condition is when playing against them. That helps you. It's just very adaptable, I think. So. Like I, so I don't too. play with the I don't play with the uh, AOE spell. I actually have, I think another. I don't know what I sub substituted it at, but yeah, it's it's either. I mean, they're so very close. It's there's different I, uses. I'm sure. I'd this say is the a last thing. Fun. The last thing I want to say about this deck is that being an aggro deck and all, a lot of people tend to, you know, give it the mean look and be like, oh, it's just one of those mindless decks that just goes face. Um, and I, I'm kind of going to play Devil's Advocate for a minute over here uh, about this deck. And it's just that um, while this deck does try to aim at the face entirely everything it has and just kind of try to win before your opponent even has a chance to do anything, and that can feel very cheesy at times. Um, like you said, Kevin, this is a very adaptable deck and it, there is a lot of decision making involved in it, but it's a different kind of decision making. It's how can I put my opponent behind and make his removal be as inefficient as possible on my little big dudes so that I can maximize my damage output every turn. And sometimes this involves trading some of your minions or using some of your removal on their minions if, if that might mean that your tunnel truck might stick for another two turns and deal a total of like 14 damage then maybe sacrificing that lava burst early on it might be worth it so there is a very nuanced kind of like decision making on aggro decks and that's kind of like what I want to end it with for at least for myself for this deck Do you guys want to mention anything else? Okay. <laughs> no, I'm good. All right. Cool. Well, that pretty much wraps up our uh, deck explanation. Uh, it's a little bit more apropos of a name this week. So uh, I had a lot of fun talking about them. It's nice to kind of uh, see a tournament, too, and, and then kind of dive a little bit deeper into the, the decks that were used uh, a lot of the time in the uh, different matchups there. So, yeah, I think that we've gone a little bit long on our... Uh, show, but it's well worth it. Uh, Cora, you want to go ahead and end our show with a couple thank yous and uh, just last minute stuff. Absolutely. You guys can always catch our blog posts at coinconcede.com along with our show notes, which we reference throughout the show. Make sure you go check those out. Uh, thanks to Stefan for letting us use his cover, and you guys can check him out on his channel, which is linked in the show notes. Uh, follow us on Twitter at coinconcede. Like and share our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash coin concede perfect and andres go ahead and tell us uh, what you're going to be up to this week yeah if you guys want to check me out 
find me on Twitter at iPlayGames. You can also find me streaming. I'll probably be streaming a lot this week, actually. Some <clears throat> Overwatch, um, maybe tomorrow morning before the beta goes down. And definitely a lot of Hearthstone. I'm playing a lot of this Yuxaran Mage and maybe a little Nasoth Pad in Patron uh, this week. I'm going to try to get to rank 5 or above. I'll be streaming that. Check it out at twitch.tv slash uh, I play games with a Z or follow me on Twitter. I usually tweet out whenever I go live and check my Overwatch podcast, the Obnick Lab that I do with Rob May. Um, we talk about Overwatch strategy, how to um, do team compositions, how to play certain heroes and just, you know, come over learn the game with us. Um, we're just starting out with it, but we're super passionate about it. Great. Yeah, definitely go check it out. I, uh, Definitely going to listen to that probably once we get into Overwatch mode. Yeah, for um, sure. All right, and Cinder, uh, where can people find you? As always, on Twitter, at Cinder Ascendant. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitch as well, twitch.tv slash Cinder Ascendant. And I have started streaming again, uh, doing it a couple nights a week. Uh, picked up some new followers and sitting around playing Hearthstone, talking about metal. It's pretty great. And uh, contact my, my man, Appa, if you want to uh, get some coaching. Give give him a little bit of love. His, his rates are actually super reasonable. I put a link in the show notes if uh, if you want to give him a try. I'd love to, to see him get some traction. Perfect. And Cora, how about you? You guys can follow me on Twitter at songbird underscore HS. Make sure if you follow me, um, shoot me a message or tweet at me. Let me know what you think about the show. I always love hearing from you guys. Um, and you can follow me on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash Sage Cora. I've been busier these last couple of weeks. My school year is coming to an end soon, so I'm focusing on finals and getting uh, some stuff done. But I should be back to streaming pretty soon. Yeah, she does a lot more singing on her stream than she does for our show. Do so. a lot oh, yeah. more singing on stream. Yeah, mm-hmm. You'll Shout out. quickly get annoyed. I, <laughs> that's not true tangent, tangent was missing that on he was actually <laughs> listen he was oh, in was our uh, yeah our uh twitch chat actually and he was mentioning oh she it, he actually wasn't listening uh live he had it on mute mm-hmm. but, so he was just having a blast watch <laughs> watching cinder uh move his head around <laughs> wave my yeah, bull head yeah. around yeah he i was actually hoping to doing sign my followers a um a live music stream for hitting 2,000 followers that I haven't followed through on yet, but I'm going to. So I'll oh. go on to Twitch Music one day and I'll pull out my guitar and I'll sing some songs for you guys live. So. Oh yeah, yeah. let us know. I, Ooh, I would definitely love to check that out. <laughs> yeah, I haven't planned when I'm going to do it yet. I'm, it'll be when I'm out of school um, and probably when I buy a better mic. So this doesn't keep happening. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm psyched. I gotta come up with like a playlist for you guys. All right. And as far as myself, you can follow me on Twitter at KCCO underscore gamer. Uh, I'm planning on doing a little Twitch event for my 500th win on my Warlock, <laughs> which will be pretty soon here. <laughs> and I wasn't going to laugh. <laughs> you laughed. I wasn't going <laughs> to. It was me. I, brought, I broke the fourth wall. All right. And um, so, yeah, if not anything, I'm planning on at least recording so i can throw up some stuff on youtube every now and then uh, because my sessions aren't all together so maybe i'll do that rather than try and get in twitch streams um but yeah other than that uh, you can go ahead and add me on battle BattleNet at uh, kcco gamer number 1752 again please let me know who you are if you've already added me and you still haven't told me who you are tell me who you are so i can leave a note (laughs) uh but yeah uh, that wraps our show up. And last thing I want to mention, keep calm and chive on. Until then, coin concede. Coin concede. Coin concede. Coin concede. Yay. <laughs> <laughs>